Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think obviously there are limits. Obviously, we can't turn everyone into Pablo Picasso or Bob Dylan. Um, but I think there there's very, very compelling evidence that just the littlest tweaks can dramatically increase creativity. So something like putting a ping pong table in, you know, in an office, giving people a space to relax is probably not feasible to install a warm shower in every corporate office. Um, you know, little studies showing that painting the walls blue allow people to score 80% higher on tests of creativity. So you give people a classic test, like the Torrance test. When they take it in a blue room compared to a red room, they score 80% higher. The, the, the simple reason is that blue, the color blue, and it has to be a certain shade of blue, makes us think about you know, the sky, the ocean, wide open spaces, light. And so we actually think in a broader, more associative manner, whereas the color red reminds us of danger, blood, stop signs. So the spotlight of attention is narrowed, and that actually constricts what we're thinking about. It constricts the kinds of things, the kind of information we take into account when trying to solve a problem. So, so red might be good if you're proofreading, but being in a blue room is probably good if you're trying to be imaginative. Um, other primes include when you tell undergraduates to imagine themselves as a seven-year-old, so you induce what's called the childlike prime. Now all of a sudden they solve 40% more insight puzzles. So just, just because when you think like a child, you put yourself in this less inhibited state of mind, and so you turn, turn it to be more imaginative. I, I mean, there, you know, there are so many studies, little studies like that, that are very clever little insights into what defines creativity in the first place. Now, obviously we don't always want to be reckless and imaginative. Sometimes you want to be self-controlled, sometimes you want to be a little repressed, sometimes you want to be very careful. But, but when we know we're engaged in a creative struggle, I think you want to go to the blue room, you want to imagine yourself as a seven-year-old, you want to put in the right kind of music and you want to, you know, go take a long, warm shower. Huh. And what, yeah, I mean, those are the good things. What are some bad things that people generally do do with the best of intentions that actually repress creativity? Well, I mean, it's everything from the obvious, from making people too scared of speaking their mind. I mean, one thing that's really surprised me while researching the book has been the, the I think, the, the powerful negative influence of what I'll call kind of insider knowledge, for lack of a better word. Um, so one of the classic examples of, of creative modeling is known as the inverted U-curve, which is this very well-studied phenomenon um, first discovered in the 19th century by an early French sociologist. Uh, and, and, and it's been true, it's been found across all sorts of fields. The basic idea is that it doesn't matter if you're a playwright or a physicist, um, people tend to exhibit a very steep rise. So they master the field and they exhibit a very steep rise in creativity until they peak at a relatively early age. So if you're a physicist, you're at your peak creative years in your late 20s, early 30s. If you're a playwright, it's a couple years later. If you're like a biologist, it's probably your late 30s. But the basic idea is that you have the steep rise followed by a long, slow, gradual decline in creativity. Now, one possibility, right, would be that the reason creativity declines with age is that you exhibit cognitive decline. Your brain gets less creative, you know, your neurons get less dense, whatever. Stuff happens inside here in these three pounds of mushy flesh that makes you less creative. That's probably not the case at all, and there are many good reasons why that's probably not the case. Instead, what a lot of people argue is that the reason creativity declines with age is that people become too uncultured, as it's known. They become too invested in the status quo, and so they stop considering radical new ideas, which might be might be wrong, might be stupid, might be silly, but might also be true that the kind of ideas that a patent clerk, a young patent clerk, might think about when he's daydreaming about space, time, and trains. Um, but, but as you get older and get lots of grant money and become very invested in the ideas that we already believe in, you become less willing and probably less able to even contemplate those kinds of ridiculous, radical new ideas. Now, the, the larger problem, I think, has to do with institutions. And, how we fund these young radicals. So you look at a place like the National Institutes of Health in America, which funds a lot of biomedical research, and it turns out when you look at the most recent year for which information on the grants is available, they give out more grants to 70-year-old scientists than to all scientists under the age of 30. And, and that's in part because these institutions also become culture. They also become risk averse. They also become less interested in funding strange new ideas. Um, so, so this isn't just about the fear of failure. I mean, obviously, you can make people scared about raising, you know, putting a new idea out there, and, and that's going to have a paralyzing effect on creativity. This is stuff that's 
really a side effect of success. These are the most successful scientists out there. And when they get lots of grant money, when they're at their peak of their scientific powers in terms of influence, in terms of numbers, papers they publish, in terms of number of postdocs working in their lab, they're actually probably nearing the end of their creative production.